Good afternoon, my name is Johan Heimans. I'm one of the partners at Van Steenbrugge Advocaten and I would like to warmly welcome you today at the launch of our Turkey Tribunal, its website and its social media. Today the website will be up and running, but it will be up and running at full speed tomorrow. If you would have any questions, feel free to ask them through YouTube or through the email address info at turkeytribunal.com. I would like to welcome you, but first of all, I would also like to explain you that we will first do the introduction in both English and Dutch and also the judicial questions that you will want to answer in our Turkey Tribunal, also in English and in Dutch. All the other aspects of our press conference will be done uniquely in English. The first thing I would like to do is to briefly explain you why we came up with this Turkey Tribunal. This Turkey Tribunal was created because we have been assisting Turkish citizens the last few years with many applications before the European Court on Human Rights, the United Nations Human Rights Committee, and often with great success. For instance, last May 2019, we obtained a groundbreaking decision before the United Nations Human Rights Committee, where it was decided that there was no more rule of law in Turkey. But we also received many other requests for people who required assistance that we could not answer. We also received many proofs and evidence and stories of people who did not necessarily want to go to an international tribunal to, ch ch to challenge the international human rights violations of which they had become the victim. So at that moment we noticed that something bigger was going on, something systematic. And we started thinking, what can we do about this in order to put this human rights issue back on the map, to examine it and to find solutions? And then my colleague, Professor van der Lanne Lotte, came up with a great idea, the idea to launch a Turkey tribunal. This tribunal is not a tribunal of which the decision will be legally binding, it is an opinion tribunal, like the Monsanto tribunal. The decision of which is not legally binding, but it has a high moral authority, because of the way the procedure is done, in a very transparent way, and because of the fact that judges with an international reputation are taking the time and effort to extensively examine and decide upon this case. And we hope by making this effort that we can put the Turkish human rights situation back on the map because no, now these times there is no more the time to remain silent. We need to do something and that we can think about the issues and hopefully come up with solutions in order to bring back to the Turkish country a uh, real human rights situation. I will this now even short in the Netherlands. I am very thankful that you are here today to watch our press conference, to the fact that our website is now online and to the fact that our social media channels are online and to the Turkish Tribunal that today was launched. If you have questions, you can do that via the YouTube channel uh, in of via het e-mailadres info at turkeytribunal.com. Wij gaan die dan ook meteen beantwoorden. Op dit ogenblik is de website al online uh, en consulteerbaar, maar vanaf morgen zal die op volle snelheid beginnen draaien en kunnen daar alle evoluties in zaken het Turkije tribunaal opgevolgd worden. Ik wil jullie hartelijk bedanken om te luisteren en ik wil jullie ook graag meegeven waarom wij eigenlijk met dit Turkije tribunaal op de proppen zijn gekomen. Dat is gebeurd omdat wij de afgelopen jaren heel veel mensen hebben bijgestaan die het slachtoffer zijn geworden van heel ernstige mensenrechten schendingen in Turkije. We hebben voor die mensen verzoekschriften ingediend bij het Europese Hof voor de rechten van de mens. We hebben dat gedaan bij het Verenigde Naties Mensenrechtencomité. Vaak met succes, bijvoorbeeld vorig jaar in mei 2019 verkregen wij een baanbrekende beslissing van het Mensenrechtencomité van de Verenigde Naties waarin werd beslist dat er geen rechtsstaat meer was in Turkije. Maar wij kregen naast die aanvragen ook nog heel veel aanvragen van mensen die we niet meteen konden verder helpen. Heel veel bewijsstukken, heel veel verhalen van mensen die wel met ons wilden delen wat ze hadden meegemaakt maar die niet noodzakelijk een verzoekschrift wilde indienen bij een internationaal rechtsorgaan. En op dat ogenblik hebben we beseft dat er iets groters aan de hand was 
iets systematisch, dat wij op een andere manier moesten aanpakken. We hebben dan ons bij elkaar gezet, we hebben gebrainstormd en mijn collega, professor Van der Lanotter, is op de proppen gekomen met dit goede idee, namelijk een Turkije tribunaal, een Turkije tribunaal waarin die mensenrechten schendingen binnen Turkije onder de loep worden genomen, erover wordt nagedacht en we proberen te komen tot oplossingen. Dat Turkije tribunaal is geen juridisch bindend tribunaal. Het is een tribunaal, een opinietribunaal, zoals het Monsanto tribunaal dat er ook in was. Het is een tribunaal waarvan de beslissing dus niet bindt, maar dat wel een zeer belangrijke moreel gezag heeft in uh, onze wereld, omwille van het feit dat de procedure die gevolgd wordt bij zo'n tribunaal op een enorm transparante manier verloopt en de rechters die zich over zo'n zaak buigen een enorme internationale reputatie hebben en die zaak zeer diepgaand en grondig bestuderen. En wij hopen eigenlijk door op deze manier te werk te gaan dat we de mensenrechten situatie in Turkije terug op de kaart kunnen plaatsen, dat we die grondig en diepgaand kunnen laten analyseren en hopelijk dat we kunnen komen tot oplossingen die de rechtsstaat in Turkije terug kunnen versterken en zelfs instellen. I just want to highlight once more that the initiative by, of this tribunal was taken by our law, law firm Van Steenbrug Advocaten. We have been defending, as I explained, the interests of many Turkish citizens for a long time. And that the coordinator of this initiative is Professor Dr. Van der Lanotte, who is professor currently at the University of Ghent and who was also one of the first uh, professors in Belgium who had a fully fledged human rights course in the country to teach to students. Ik wil graag nog even benadrukken dat dit initiatief wordt genomen door het advocatenkantoor van Steenbrugge Advocaten, omdat wij al jarenlang Turkse mensen bijstaan die met dergelijke mensenrechtenproblemen kampen. En dat dit project wordt gecoördineerd door professor Dr. Van der Lanotte, die momenteel professor is aan de Universiteit van Gent en die jaren geleden, in de jaren 80, de eerste was, of een van de eerste was, die in België een volledige mensenrechtencursus aanbood aan studenten. Hij was toen een pionier en hij probeert dat vandaag de dag door middel van dit Turkije tribunaal opnieuw te zijn. Dank u. Uh, so we first will present uh, the tribunal, tribunal itself, the judges. Uh, we have for a moment six judges. Uh, it is still possible that someone will come in. That is someone who is uh, who had problems with health. So, for a moment, that's not clear, but we have six judges. The president of the tribunal will be Professor uh, Françoise Tulkens. She is uh, a professor, she was a professor in uh, Louvain-la-Neuve in Belgium. She was judge at the European Court of Human Rights and vice president of the European Court of Human Rights. Uh, she is well known. She was also president of the Monsanto Tribunal, so she has some experience in that and she accepted to be president of our Turkey Tribunal. Uh, the second one is Justice uh, Johan van der Westhuizen. Johan van der Westhuizen was professor in Pretoria. He was there the founder of the Human Rights uh, Center, which now is one of the largest in the world. Uh, in Pretoria is a very strong uh, human rights center. And he also was, after the apartheid was abolished, <coughs> excuse me, she, he was also judge and very respected judge in the Constitutional Court of South Africa. He is still judge uh, for the moment in Lesotho, but uh, uh, the, the Constitutional Court in South Africa was really an important part of his uh, career. The third judge is uh, Professor uh, Elizabeth Arby Merchant. She's uh, active in the United States for the moment in the Washington uh, College of Law. Washington College of Law is a reputed uh, uh, university in the United States for international law mostly, but uh, she was all, also a long time deputy executive secretary of the Inter-American Court of Human Rights. And we thought it was very important that besides the European system, we also always also had a link with this Inter-American uh, human rights uh, system. Professor uh, Giorgio Malinverni was professor at the University of Geneva. He was member of the Venice Commission, the Venice Commission more about democracy in countries, uh, human rights, but also democracy issues. Venice Com Commission, and he was also judge at the European Court of Human Rights. Uh, he's still active 
in some human, human rights uh, movements in his country, which is uh, Switzerland. Professor Lady uh, Bianco is from Albania. He was also a judge in the European Court uh, of Human Rights. He was also a member of the Venice Commission and he's actually a professor in international law, in associate professor in uh, Strasbourg and is very well, knows very well the European situation of court. Dr. John Pace uh, at the last is from Australia. He was the chief of the Human Rights Office of the UN Assistance Mission to Iraq and several other missions uh, around the world. But more importantly, he was the secretary to the Commission on Human Rights of the United Nations from 78 till 94. And so with him, we also have a good link with that other human rights system, which is the United Nations uh, system. So we have uh, judges from the European Court, we have uh, executive secretary of the Inter-American uh, system, we have the secretary of the UN uh, system, and all these people are quite reputed, they are active at universities, uh, they, they have, uh, let's say, a record of independent judges, and uh, also it's clear they have nothing to fear, nothing to win, they just do it because they think it is an important case that we should do. They will work on the basis of reports that will be made, uh, the reporters. First one is Eric Sotas. Eric Sotas was uh, the Secretary General for a long time from the World Organization Against Torture. And Mr. Sotas will write a report, and I will help him, uh, about torture. Um, you see, we have prepared this that each, uh, each issue that we treat has some questions that should be answered by the tribunal. You find, by the way, the text on the website. The website, as we said, uh, is not really functioning as fast as we wanted. That will be tomorrow because we, of course, too late in some changings we wanted to make. But the text of the press conferences is available there. You can also ask us uh, by, by, uh, on, on the on the chat room or by email uh, to get the text. What are the questions? I will give them in English and in, in Dutch. Question one is about torture. Uh, can we see a pattern in the facts underlying the torture testim testimonies? So the pattern, not the fact we, it's not important for us to know that there are 500, 600, 407, whatever. It is the pattern in it, it is the structure of it. What groups are targeted and why these groups what is the motivation and what is the highest level of the state involvement? What is the responsibility of the state uh, in this? Second question about torture. Do the this testimonies sorry, about torture allow us to conclude there is a systematic and organized use of torture in Turkey or is that not the case? In het Nederlands kunnen we een patroon zien in de feiten die te grondslag liggen aan de getuigenis over foltering. Zien we daar een patroon in? Welke groepen worden geviseerd? Waarom deze groepen? Wat is de echte bedoeling? Waarom is die, tortering, uh, die foltering daar? En hoe sterk is het hoogste niveau van de staat hierbij uh, betrokken? Of is dat een zaak uh, van de lokale gevangenis? Uh, professor Haak en uh, Dr. Anders Emre Turkut will make a report on impunity. Yves Haak is professor at the University of Ghent. Emre Turku is finalizing his PhD exactly on the evaluation of the post-coup uh, decisions that were made in Turkey. And the question is, uh, is there existing an internal system of preventing and monitoring torture or mistreatment? And if yes, how does it function? Second question, so question four is that, is there an if efficient uh, system of sanctioning if mistreatment or torture occurs? Is there an effective system of sanctioning this mistreatment or torture? Or can we speak of an organized impunity towards, towards mistreatment and torture against people held in detention? Dus de vragen hier zijn, is er een intern systeem sowieso om het op te volgen? En dat is de eerste vraag, is daar een systeem dat dat opvolgt en dat het ook kan voorkomen? Maar als er dan toch volgende vraag een foltering aanwezig is, is er een manier om dat effectief te sanctioneren, te bespraffen? Of moeten we eigenlijk spreken van een georganiseerde straffeloosheid die voor mensen die vastgehouden worden uh, heerst. Is een duidelijke vraagstelling ook daarover. 
Third report is a lawyers' collective in uh, in Turkey, which uh, will write the report anonymously because uh, for security reasons. The organizing committee, that's we, uh, will ask a reputable and independent person to function as an auditor to visit them, to discuss with them, and see if their report really can be certified. Uh, because anonymously you have to be careful what is written but so we will have a certification if the report is good enough that we can rely on and the question that this report should answer is can we evaluate the situation of lawyers in Turkey and their relationship with their clients and the way they can organize the defense as guaranteeing the principle of a fair trial in accordance with international standards. Dus voor die vijfde vraag Die gaat over rechtsbijstand en dat rapport zal anoniem geschreven worden eh, door een aantal advocaten. Die hebben dat eh, beloofd, maar wensen hun naam niet bekend te maken. Wij zullen dan iemand, een high-ranked person, sturen om met die mensen te praten die dat geschreven hebben. En op die manier certifiëren dat het rapport gemaakt is zoals het moet gebeuren. Want anoniem kun je natuurlijk altijd schrijven wat je wilt. Dat gaat niet, we kunnen dat niet zomaar doen. De naam van degene die dat gecertifieerd is, heeft... Als dat gebeurt, als het goed genoeg is natuurlijk, zal ook bekendgemaakt worden nadien uiteraard niet uh, daarvoor. En de vraag is, kunnen we de situatie van advocaten in Turkije, hun relatie met hun cliënten en de manier waarop ze de verdediging kunnen organiseren, evalueren als voldoende garantie biedend voor een eerlijk proces in overeenstemming met de internationale normen. The next rapporteur is Professor Sepnem Korur Finchanchi. She is uh, a Turkish doctor, medical doctor. She uh, was the head of the Istanbul Forensic Medicine Department. She's president of uh, Human Rights Foundation, and she has a long career in forensic uh, medicine. Her question to answer is, is the level of medical care, the medical staffing, the procedures to assure a timely reaction and the possibilities to rely on specialized services if needed in the Turkish prisons and other places where people are kept in custody in accordance with what is needed to preserve their right to health in conformity with international recognized standards. So what we ask here in this custody situation, can people rely on the adequate medical uh, help? Next question, because we are also talking about uh, torture. What are the guarantees, the euro et de facto, not only in the law but also in the facts, that the medical staff will be able to examine and independently report any mistreatment and or torture on persons held in prison or in any, or any other form of custody? Dus dit rapport gaat over medische hulp. Professor Vincianci is een zeer gekend iemand, is een dokter uh, die daarin gespecialiseerd is en die gekend is van geen blad voor de mond te houden. Waarbij de eerste vraag is namelijk, is de zorg eh, die aanwezig is in, voor mensen die in gevangen gehouden worden of in voorlopige hechtenis zitten, wat het ook is, is de zorg voldoende? Is er voldoende bestaffing? Zijn er procedures om tijdig te reageren? Kan men beroep doen op gespecialiseerde diensten? Zo nodig. Dat is eigenlijk dus het medisch aanbod, om zo te zeggen. De volgende vraag daar is, wat zijn de garanties in de feiten en in rechten dat het medisch personeel in staat zal zijn om elke vorm van mishandeling en of foltering uh, of een andere vorm van hechtenis te onderzoeken en onafhankelijk te uh, melden. Dus met andere woorden, als er iets gebeurt, ze, ze, zal die medische staf kunnen correct ageren. Then we have about abductions, uh, a joint report with the Ankara Bar Association from Turkey and Johan Heymans next to me here from Belgium, uh, a report on forced disappearances. Uh, the, uh, the Ankara Bar Association has a human rights branch. They already made a report, they published a report, we will use that. Johan Heymans will uh, complement it. Uh, he has experience in abduction cases and we will by these two have a complete report. Uh, the question here is, can we take into account the reports and the testimonies uh, produced before the tribunal? conclude that abductions, again, are a part of the action of the state towards opposing persons and that no serious, in serious inquiry is organized about these facts. I'm sorry. Uh, dus Ankara Bar Association en uh, Johan Heibans hier aanwezig. En de vraag die ze daar zullen stellen gaat, 
Kunnen we rekening houden met de rapporten en de getuigenissen die voor het tribunaal zijn opgesteld, concluderen dat ontvoeringen opnieuw deel uitmaken van de actie van de staat ten aanzien van de tegenstanders en dat er geen serieus onderzoek naar deze feiten wordt georganiseerd. Het gaat dus over ontvoeringen. Last uh, topic uh, is, uh, will be written by Philippe Leroud. He is from Belgium. He is the former president of the International Federation of Journalists. And he has two questions that he should give his uh, view on. Can Turkey at this stage be considered as a country within which a sufficient degree of freedom of the press and freedom of expression is guaranteed so it can be in compliance with the standards of a good functioning democracy? <coughs> Question 10. Can the decisions taken by the Turkish government still be considered as a reaction linked to the coup d'etat or need they to be evaluated as a way to destroy the voices and the organizations critical towards the government in Turkey. Dus die negende en tiende vraag die komen op het konto van Philippe Leroux. Philippe Leroux, vroegere voorzitter van de Internationale Federatie van uh, Journalisten. En de twee vragen die, waar, waar hij op antwoord moet op zijn beurt eerst suggereren of, of geven en waar de judges dan gaan over oordelen. Kan Turkije in dit stadium worden beschouwd als een land waar een voldoende mate van persvrijheid en vrijheid van meningsuiting is gewaarborgd? zodat het kan voldoen aan de normen van een goed functionerende democratie. En dat gaat over vrije meningsuiting. En dan meer algemeen kunnen de beslissingen van de Turkse regering nog worden beschouwd als een reactie die verband houdt met de staatsgreep. Of moeten we ze evalueren als een manier om de stemmen en of organisaties die kritisch staan tegenover de regering het zwijgen op te leggen. En daarmee zijn we aan de tiende zaak. We hebben ervoor gezorgd, dat is belangrijk dat heel deze operatie door een groep personen wordt begeleid die garant staan voor de, voor de onafhankelijkheid, maar dat zal Johan toelichten. So that will be the, the steering committee. These are the people that will assist with a number of administrative and practical uh, challenges that the tribunal will be facing. That uh, steering committee will consist of the president, which will be emeritus professor uh, Mark Bossert, who was formerly a professor at the University of Antwerp, who was also the president uh, of the Constitutional Court in Belgium, and who was also the president of the United, uh, Commission, United, United Nations Commission on Human Rights. Then we will have Jan de Bok, who was one of the Belgian top diplomats. He was a diplomat for Belgium to the European Union and to the United Nations. Then we also have Christine Musser, who is also one of the uh, partners here at the law firm. She has a very long uh, career in human rights law and is very specialized in anything that is related to sexual crimes and sexual uh, abuse. Then we have the professor Dr. Rick van der Wallen, who is the rector at the University of Ghent. And finally, professor Dr. Caroline Powells, who is the rector at the University of Brussels. They will assist with the practical um, administration of this tribunal. Another important challenge that we have been facing is the financial aspect of this tribunal. Also on that level we want to be completely transparent. The tribunal will be financed so all the costs will be covered by a crowd uh, funding. A crowd funding that will allow people, uh, individuals and companies to finance the tribunal for a maximum of 5,000 euros per person in order to avoid that um, there is too much influence by a number of, of donators uh, in the practical functioning of, of the tribunal, which is not a point, it should be completely uh, independent. And then everything will be handled and dealt with in uh, a non-profit organization, so the purpose is not to make profits, just to cover expenses, and this uh, budget will be managed by this independent uh, steering committee. All the details for people who would want to make a donation will be on our website, uh, which is now online. Then some additional information. The Turkey Tribunal will be held in Geneva 21st till 25th of uh, September this year, if, if Corona, of course, does not come in between, which we hope, but you never know. So we have to, how would you say that in, in the stock market, you have to give a notice to the market. But we think 
2125 uh, September will be okay. We are optimistic. Uh, this is from Monday uh, till uh, Friday, the first four days. For each topic, the report will be presented. Uh, the report will be on the website already the 15th of August. That's what we want to reach. So everyone will be able to read it. The judges will get it. And then the judges will and can uh, ask questions about the report before the session. Even. The reports also will be sent to the Turkish government. They can respond. They can defend themselves. It's no problem. Today, it's still, I will send the mail to the ambassador of Turkey in Belgium to explain how everything is goes. We don't. We want to be as transparent as possible. So then, each day we will have one or two topics with the report, a discussion about the report with the judges, and we must uh, be clear: these six judges, they are really experienced people. They will not ask simple questions. They will not. Uh, go over that lightly and we want per topic to have two three witnesses people who witness about their situation we think that is also important and then uh, monday tuesday wednesday uh, thursday friday morning there is no session and we hope that friday uh, in the afternoon the judges will come with their uh, verdict Everything we do will be on the website. We will have uh, streaming during uh, the, the, the tribunal. We will take small videos with the, the, the short content of it. So everything will be very transparent. There are two side events, one during the tribunal and one later. The first one is a side event, most probably on the Wednesday, so the 23rd, about persecution of elected people in Europe and that's not only, not only about Turkey but of course the thing you're thinking the most is about Catalonia but how uh, is the situation the freedom of speech of uh, parliamentary uh, people in the European uh, zone actually the zone of the Council of Europe and the second side event is normally in March in Geneva also a two days event about the impartiality and the independence of the judiciary which of course is very crucial in all these uh, discussions so i think we have done uh, all the the comment you see websites uh, are announced uh, you can have it and uh, once again uh, if uh, the, the text of the presentation will be on the website now in dutch english and in turkish already also um, you can still ask questions, so perhaps we wait two, three minutes. If you have questions, you just mail them or just to the chat room uh, on YouTube and then we will answer them. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, for the moment there are no questions. Uh, you will find the way to contact us uh, on my uh, mobile, myself, and on info at turkeytribunal.com uh, to ask questions. This uh, all, both uh, the phone and the email address will be open uh, all day. Um, to once again repeat, third week of September. Important is that all the reports will be published and that everyone can react on that. We think that's uh, important. Also, we hope, of course, the Turkish government will also respond. We don't know if they will, but they can. So we want to have it a real tribunal with all these high ranked judges. We really want to assure the quality of the judgment and the quality of a judgment is also depending, of course, the way you have uh, let's say that all visions being heard uh, in this uh, discussion uh, anyhow we have no questions for the moment if i'm is that okay is that so yeah okay so uh, we thank you uh, about uh, that um, the press uh, release will be online also will be online on the website eh? and uh, any questions can be asked by phone or by email. Thank you very much. Thank you.